the never ending onslaught of information for Cathay, well, never ends with today's video on the campaign mechanics for Cathay. Now, this is not going to cover all the campaign mechanics as this article kind of illustrates that they're going to start talking about mechanics more and more as they ramp up closer and closer to the release date of Total War Warhammer 3. But today we're going to find out a lot about Harmony. The Wu Jing Compass, which is a new thing, obviously, the Great Bastion, as well as the technology tree for Cathay. And in my typical fashion of kind of upfronting everything, oh, also the Ivory Road, we'll be talking about that too. Um, to kind of give you a, a quick breakdown of this, you'll constantly be running a razor's edge of trying to balance the yin and yang for Cathay. All of their buildings, all of their units, pretty much everything contributes to a gauge on the campaign map, which will push things left or right. And you're supposed to basically try to um, keep things in the center for a maximum bonus. But you can push things left. I think it's left towards yin and right towards yang. I'm not sure. Uh, we don't really know what that um icon looks like but pushing it left or right will maybe give you a certain bonus that you might need in a very specific location like hey you know i really need my melee units buffed up or whatever the bonuses are from pushing something more towards yin or yang i'm going to do that or, or whatever it kind of incurs for you on the campaign map so basically you'd want to keep it centralized but it looks like pushing it one way or another could fit a very certain circumstance that you're in for the ivory road it's honestly it's exactly like i speculated it is the um very similar, it seems, to the mechanic from Troy where you send an actual expedition out and it goes about doing things, and we'll get into it in more detail in that section, but it looks really fun. The Wujin Compass is another thing where you're kind of running a razor, Razor's Edge where you're trying to balance one of four active abilities while gaining the passive buffs of the other four or the other three. And then we also get the Great Bastion Wall, which has got three gates very similar to Ulthwan that will give you specific bonuses depending on if you own one, two, or all three gates. So that's kind of your quick breakdown of what this video entails. There's quite a lot of information, so we're going to jump into it, but that just kind of gives you a nice overview of what we'll touch on. If you're, if you're interested in hearing about those mechanics, stick around and we'll just jump into them, especially this Harmony one first, because it's going to be pretty huge. But if that's all you wanted to know, please don't feel free or feel free to feel free to <laughs> shut the video down. But before you do, don't forget to like, comment and or subscribe. I can't tell you how much that helps me. And if you have not yet pre-ordered Total War Warhammer 3 and you want to feel free to use the link in my description to the Nexus store. They get Steam keys directly from the developers and it is a great way to support the channel. Let's get started here on the campaign mechanics for Grand Cafe. And the first one to get started on is Harmony. But up front, they did kind of outline some caveats here saying you know this is not finalized we are looking for feedback from you guys so if you have any comments or any statements about what we're talking about today in this blog post go ahead and share them and as i always say guys if you're wanting to share some feedback let it be known in a constructive proper way don't just say shit sucks don't like it i mean who that doesn't help anyone so if you say hey you know i don't like these things about the harmony mechanic or if this was this way or this was that way it's going to help you create the game that you want to see come the beginning of 2022 or early 2022 so try to share as much constructive criticism as you can if you are not i don't know interested if you're not if you don't really enjoy one of the mechanics so let's take a look here at harmony and harmony like i said is going to be really kind of balancing that razor's edge and we don't know a ton of what contributes to your harmony gauge it does say here that um there are a lot of things that do contribute to it. So let's go into this. So as we've discussed previously, Harmony is everything in Grand Cathay. The smooth combination of range, firepower, and stalwart front lines. The well-being of the populace alongside their unswerving loyalty. As well as boosting the power of differently aligned units in battle, you must keep your faction as a whole in balance through considerate building choices, lord picks, and technology. So there you go. You get those three things giving you a sway in your um, yin and yang gauge and also your units it seems to be because we've seen this already from the siege rework video we saw the unit cards and they have the yin and yang distinction right on the card and when we take a look at technology later you'll see that yin and yang distinction on a lot of those technologies curious though we did not see it on the building tree i didn't see any yin and yang icons on the building tree which you're all seeing in front of you right now and same thing with lord picks when we looked at the unit cards we didn't see any yin and yang distinction so interesting there 
But just about everything will nudge the harmony of your faction one way or the other, all tracked by a handy bar at the top of the screen. Should you drift towards one side, it will become cheaper to push back to the center, but your overrepresented buildings will be less effective, and your control of your province will drop. Maintaining the middle point is the biggest reward, giving significant bonuses or boons to all areas of your empire and a unique army ability to summon the spirits of ancestors long dead to help out in battle. With every research technology, built building, and hired lord trying to dislodge it, maintaining this for an extended period can be challenging, but it's more than worth it, even for just a couple turns. And when it jumps into the technology section of this video, it talks about how technology can skew your harmony permanently one direction or the other. So you have to constantly counterbalance that with an opposing skewing technology. So it's going to be, it, it seems like there is a lot more micro to the campaign of Cathay, which I'm, I'm actually very interested in. I've always said that the Total War Warhammer campaign, once you reach turn, what, like 50, 60 and your economy takes off, it just becomes too easy. It's so easy to snowball. And we get in the latter um, DLCs of Warhammer 2, a lot better mechanics that keep you more interested and engaged that are outside of just, okay, how can I get as much money as possible and just take over? So I like that this harmony gauge exists because you're constantly having to tool things. Let's move into another mechanic now. And that here is the Wu Jing Compass. And it's pretty interesting looking. And we, we know we get the Wu Jing War Compass as an actual unit on the battlefield, but this thing looks pretty sweet. So let's read these two paragraphs. Then I'm going to show you the actual picture that is in this blog post blown up so you can see everything that we talk about as we go through the individual bonuses and passives. But the Wujing Compass is a great magical device built into the holy city of Wei Jin, created by the Celestial Dragon Emperor to control the winds of magic within Grand Cathay. Its primary purpose is to project power to and help defend the Great Bastion when it is under threat, but the progeny of the Emperor can direct it as they wish to serve their purposes. Whenever the compass is directed to one of its four points, that area begins to fill with magic. Most provide a faction-wide buff that is always active, with another that is only available when the compass is pointed its way. As that area fills with magic, the compass ability grows in strength. However, if the compass is pointed elsewhere, the magic in the area begins to drop, depowering the passive. This balancing act depends on your needs as well as any emergencies you may be facing and must be chosen wisely as there is a turn limit on changing the compass again. Here's the breakdown of the regions and their effects. So we get again Razor's Edge, right? This, this kind of constant need to balance these things. And I really do like this because, okay, if I really want to get um, a huge bonus to my defensive supplies, well, I'm going to be pointing this bad boy at the Great Bastion and it's going to be charging that up. And it looks like from this picture, you know, we see four separate portions of the gauge, each, each quadrant, each quarter, and those will probably give us um, diminished or increased buffs to either the active or the passive. So let me read through all these. So starting with the Great Bastion here, we get a passive buff, provides additional supplies for Grand Cafe, armies defending settlements, and additional casualty replenishment for all armies. The active buff decreases recruitment costs and provides a unique army ability to drop meteors on enemies. That is fucking spicy. I love that. I love that, especially because we know that the Great Maw is pulled down from Grand Cathay, so it fits in really juicy into that whole entire lore tidbit, and we know that the Wujing War Compass says that it uh, pulls down meteors and summons storms. So I love that little bit here for the Great Bastion. Uh, Great Bastion, not Passion. I keep saying Passion. But either way, looks really nice for that active buff. The next one here is the Celestial Lake. It gives a passive buff that provides growth to all Grand Cathay factions. It's an its active buff gives additional income and stronger winds of magic growth within Grand Cathay regions. So I do again like this whole okay, if I want to go with more of a militaristic route, or I need I know I'm getting sieged up the butt right now. I'm gonna go. <laughs> That is a terrible turn of phrase. Um, I'm going to go Great Bastion. Well, you know what? No, I need better income, and I'm going to go with a, a little bit more Winds of Magic. Well, I'm going into Celestial Lake to get that active buff. I really like that you can kind of tool this as to what makes the most sense for what how your campaign's going. But Warpstone Desert is a bit different. So no passive buff for Warpstone D Desert at all. But its active buff lowers corruption across Grand Cathay, guarantees lower winds of magic reserve, and gives a leadership buff or debuff to enemy armies inside the nation, which I really like because 
as we see when we'll take a look at the uh, the building browser, we're going to look at some of the quality of life improvements for the campaign map. You can see that there's a ton of new corruption. There's vampiric. There's each one of the chaos gods' respective corruption. So and skaven corruption. So on top of it, you're just going to have so many different types of corruption that you can help mitigate that with Warpstone Desert, knowing that Cathay is probably going to be against a lot of chaos of some variation, shape, or form in the north. Probably going to deal with some variation, shape, or form of Skaven in the West. They've already kind of outlined that. And I'm sure there will be the presence of the Jade Vampires as disclosed in the Lorebeards podcast uh, with Loremaster of Sotek and Great Book of Grudges that they did with Andy Hall. They, he, he kind of, com well, he confirmed that the Jade uh, Blooded Vampires exist in Cathay. So I'm imagining all this corruption is really going to be coming down hard on you in Cathay. The last one here, though, is Dragon Emperor's Wrath. The passive buff provides control to all Grand Cathay factions, which is going to be pretty nice. But then the active effect, only at full energy reserve, applies massive attrition to all Chaos Forces besieging the Great Bastion. So this is one of those ones where it's, it's like an all-in, right? You have to keep the compass directed at it for a long period of time. We don't know what the long period of time is to kind of boost it, like what, what it will do how, or how fast these... Um, these points will build in magic reserve. So if you know you're coming up to a really big war at the north, you're probably going to want to point that Dragon Emperor's Wrath or point that compass towards the Wrath to get that massive attrition um, to all things besieging the Great Bastion. So I'm very interested to see about that. And we'll get into it once we jump into the Great Bastion section. But let's move into now the Ivory Road. So the Ivory Road, as we talked about, is basically it, it's it's our equivalent of the Silk Road, right? And this acts as a massive trade route from Grand Cathay all the way into the Old World. And they use these things called Grand Caravans to traverse the Ivory Road. And we talked about this in a lot of the speculation videos here for Grand Cathay. And I always said, like, hey, what if it was just like this from Troy? And it seems to be that it won't be exactly like an expedition from Troy, but it'll be very similar. Because it talks about even the ability to attack this on the road which i really like so let me i'm going to skip this first paragraph and we're going to go into the second one because that's the actual mechanic but when playing as a grand cathay faction you can dispatch a caravan whenever you like sending it along one of the many paths of the ivory road this will take it through various regions some of which may prove treacherous at various points you choose which direction the caravan will next take with it progressing naturally across the map while you don't have a direct control over it, it does have a vision as a normal army would, giving you important scouting information as it goes. With each major rest stop along the route, various events and dilemmas can fire. Found friends, ogre mercenaries, new routes, and many more surprise, surprises await upon the road. These can result in battles, bonuses, further cargo, air, or any combination. Once a caravan reaches a destination, you will receive a money based on or money based on cargo amount and some other factors, and it will begin to return home. At this point, another caravan can be sent out. Each caravan has its own leader, so just like Troy, a new lord type with a unique blue skill tree for increasing the, bo the boons of caravans, extra cargo, more replenishment between rest stops, etc. So I like that. It's a specific lord that's catered just to this versus in Troy. You made a lord, you sent them on the expedition, then you got him after that, which is kind of like tedious because now you have this guy who you wanted to complete a mechanic with who is now jacking up your, um, what's it called? The, the, the replenishment, the, the, the trade resources. The thing when you create a lord and, and it hinders your, your overall uh, income gain because it chops a percentage of it off. So I didn't like that. And I like that this is going to be a specific lord for it. So they can naturally also take various combat upgrades depending on what you think they might, they might get up to. The key to this mechanic is finding safe routes or building caravans that can take the punishment of the big wide world, plus making smart decisions about how and when to fight. If you're opposing Grand Cathay in the campaign, surely you wouldn't dare, you can find their caravans on the map and attack them. So I love that. Doing so and winning will destroy the caravan, making it a good way to starve them of resources. Of course, it does involve declaring war with all the diplomatic consequences that entails. Dragons may be pleased if you take out rebel caravans, but less so if you if you if you target theirs. So a we get rebel caravans. That's cool. And I see this caravan mechanic very similar now to the Vampire Coast, right? How in the Vampire Coast campaign you have trade caravans coming to and from Tilia or Astalia, and you can intercept them and attack them and get a bunch of stuff. And it's part of the actual campaign itself uh, for the sea shanties. So 
I like that. I, I like that 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 is kind of takes that little bit of kind of organic content where it's kind of moving across the map and you have to intercept it, but it adds this cool fun dilemma portion to it. So basically you're like kind of on the, on the receiving end of uh of one of those Vampire Coast um, expeditions. So I do really enjoy the Ivory Road. I think it's gonna be cool. And it's also pretty minimally invasive, right? You're not having to micromanage this thing as it goes, um, having to move it manually, or oh, you, you forgot to move it one turn, it's stuck here now in the Darklands for three turns. I like that this will kind of progress um, automatically and you get scouting information from it. So I really, really enjoyed that new mechanic. Now let's jump into the big daddy here, the Great Bastion. So this section I'm going to break into two. We're going to talk about the Great Bastion first, and then we're going to talk about some campaign quality of life upgrades I've noticed from just looking at this screen. So first off, looking at the Great Bastion, um, we see that this is named the Western Great Bastion. And I think that the Great Bastion itself might be divided into three sections. And we're going to talk about that when we get into the gate portion. But basically, this section talks about how, you know, this is obviously a very important portion of Miao Ying's campaign. But it's also important for Zhao's campaign when he kind of gets to the point that he needs to intercede. So the Great Bastion takes the form of a massive impa impassable wall with three gates that must be controlled and held by the forces of Grand Cathay. Chaos forces are constantly attempting assaults on it, but the larger ones come from a slow buildup of forces in the wastes. These must be dealt with through sallying forth or preparing your defenses with commandments at each gatehouse if you hold them. The threat to the Great Bastion is tracked through a meter at the top of the screen, which fills as chaos prepares an assault and descends if they are defeated. Keeping the threat low and reaching zero are looked on favorably by the Celestial Dragon Emperor who will reward those who do so. Allowing a breach as well as earning his ire means Chaos is now rampaging through the soft heartland of Cathay, a recipe for disaster. The fortress gate cities, the Snake Gate, the Dragon Gate, the Turtle Gate, share a unique building tree and commandments. These serve various purposes and, will, and you will need to balance constant vigilance with the need to rest and re recuperation of the uh, at the edge of chaos I was like, what does that mean once a gate is returned to its glory at tier five it reduces the cooldown on using the wujing war compass so it does have a lot of really nice mechanics built into it too I like that you have to progress this up it's not just simply the gate like it was in ulthwan you get these four build slots as you can see for the snake gate so western great bastion makes sense here for the snake gate so i think we probably have a northern and an eastern or center a central and an eastern uh, great bastion which would house then the dragon gate and the turtle gate maybe respectively we don't know we don't know which one's where and with that, we get this little building here that does the Bastion Fortress. It gives us Wujing Compass cooldown minus one turn because it does cost us turn. Or there is a cooldown of turns in between shifting the Wujing Compass. Income generated 400, Diplomatic Relations plus two with Cathay. Defensive Supplies plus 2,500, which is juicy, and growth of 50. One outside Ogre or Norskin homeland adds walls to the settlement. So you get a lot of cool stuff here. You also see that we get some um, options. But you get just basic and advanced military uh, buildings and then three different defensive units. Or no, this looks like four total defensive buildings that um, probably look like they help out with ranged, with melee, with the walls, and then maybe with the towers, if I'm thinking of that. If I'm looking at it from right to left, right? Right would, looks like it's melee oriented. That the, the second to the right looks like it is um, perhaps melee oriented or something, something with wood. And then you've got those towers in that uh, left center. And then far left, you've got those uh, gates with the wall. So probably something having to do with bonuses towards that. So I do like that. And I like that it, it looks like, okay, hey, you're, you're at the gates. And you get reports of something, uh, of a mass of chaos forces growing outside the gate. And you either have to sally forth or prepare. And this is cool because I was wondering, like, how the hell do you know when you're going to get besieged? It doesn't make much sense to me. But now that it seems like, obviously, too, you also have this meter tracking it, right? The threat to the Great Bastion is tracked through a meter at the top of the screen, which fills as chaos repairs and assault and descends if they are defeated. So this is when you know, hey, I got to switch my compass to um, a Dragon Emperor mode because I'm going to need a lot of attrition to eat away at the armies that are about to besiege me. And I think that that's a really cool way to kind of, oh, crap, I really got to I got to gear up right now. It creates a lot of tension in the campaign and it makes for a cool natural progression point to a cool climax versus. All right, well, I'm working on my. Oh, great. I'm besieged and I just lost my ma my massive economic center that was powerhousing my entire economy. And now I have to kind of deal with that. So I like that there seems to be 
this progression in the north that's not just simply willy-nilly it's kind of actually on a gauge what i am curious about is now that there's like two or three gauges of progress we're going to have for cathay right we've got the one where uh, we've got the one gauge for harmony which i think is at the top left of the screen which we'll talk about in a bit uh we've got the one here for the great bastion and some sort of indication of a gauge for the Wu Jing compass and maybe one for the ivory road so there's a lot to kind of unpack here with the gauges and the mechanics for cathay and i'm i'm excited but uh, we didn't really hear about any of this for for Kislev or for Corn, so I hope they have equally as as in depth or awesome mechanics because Cafe's mechanics seem damn awesome, and I'm really cool, really interested to jump in a lot of these cool mechanics. So let's now pivot over to these campaign quality of life improvements, just really quick by looking at just simply this building screen, right? Looking at the building browser, taking a look at the upper left. We obviously get our funds, nothing cool there. We get that that first indication of the harmony scale, right? I think that's easily what we can expect for the harmony gauge. It looks like we get three nodules to the left and three nodules to the right, and that'll probably switch to either yin or yang. It looks like it's, I don't, I don't even know. Um, I was gonna say it looks like it's in the center right now because you see both icons. Maybe they Maybe one icon will kind of dominate the other depending on which direction you are and i'm sure there's going to be a color indication on those little lotus blossoms as you move left or right so very nice little uh little i'm not even a quality of life but that's cool to see that but the lower left we can see quality of life so it's cool to get an actual visual representation of your growth status versus kind of looking at the number going okay the growth is at this turns until that five it's nice to just be able to look at a glance. I can see a circular gauge. I know it's coming. I know how much is, is going to happen. Oh, four turns. Cool. Got it. I don't have to really read much text, which I mean, it's not like there was much text to begin with, but still it's a bit more of an at a glance gauge, which I really like. And then for control, it's nice to also see the different quadrants, either negative or positive for control. And the bonus is applied to it because the more in control or the less in control you are the more penalties or the more benefits that you get so it's nice to be able to just be able to hover over each one of those know what to expect as i grow my control in my region and then far left on the right or far right we can see the corruption gauges so again chaos vampiric skaven corn nurgle sonesh and then zinch corruption so that is going to really make mitigating your corruption pretty huge for cathay and it's cool to be able to see just that nice visual representation of what's going on even in the building browser here so um really nice quality of life upgrades here for the campaign and now let's move into the technology of cathay this will actually be our last section and it's pretty interesting the way they've broken up the technology trees it's very reminiscent to a lot of mechanics that we've seen in um uh three kingdoms oh and hey there you go you can see at the top that it looks like we're getting one step to the right and it is black so we are uh it's it's not even showing uh white at all so you can see that's kind of skewing in one direction entirely is what it looks like but the tech tree here talks about how um, everything is split into three branches, right? And through these three branches, you get yin, yang, and then a neutral one that doesn't really affect either for the most part, unless you take a step in that direction. You can take a step down into harmonic balance yin or uh, contain aggression up to yang. You've got those kind of uh, options there. So I, I do really like this because again, it creates, it creates a little bit more of a story or a narrative te to technology. Um, rather than just trying to like blitz the ones that are the best and I think that that is a little more more fun because as we read here you'll see that some of them are actually permanent shifts one way or another so the central and least large offers minor improvements but doesn't push into either yin or yang directions the other two are broadly focused on melee and range combat though include many many other elements and push in the yin and yang directions respectively each technology research pushes your harmony in that direction permanently, with some doing this multiple times. That makes it a balancing act between what you need to buff, your armies, and your needs for harmony. This, along with all the other systems that interact with harmony, can be quite a lot to govern every turn. Having harmony during key battles or moments is more important than maintaining it constantly, though of course you could abandon that track to focus almost purely in one direction. Many technologies give boons to armies that are more one way than the other and naturally affect the units that are most likely to be in those armies of course each legendary lord has a preference too and some of their skills can push one way or the other too 
A few times, the tech tree for Grand Cathay recombines into one central point, then branches out again. Planning your next few turns of research in the armies that you will want to support will give significant boons as you prioritize your route through the tree. There are many dead-end paths with big rewards, but which aren't the prerequisites for anything else. When to take those is vitally important. So, you can see that there's those dead-end paths at the top, you know, right of Yang and horse bonding, or to the south, to the south, to the bottom, uh, Grace of uh, Chua Yin, or Grace of Chua Yin? Uh, I'm not really sure. And then defensive formations. So you, you get some pretty interesting kind of breakout of this technology tree. And it is a pretty slim technology tree, too. That's kind of worth noting. And I like you compare this to, say, the dwarf technology tree, which is seven and a half pages long. It's because of, as long as the Book of Grudges. Then you look at this bad boy, and it's, I don't know, what is this like? This looks like it's maybe 20 total, 25 total technologies. So I'm really curious to see. Um, well, it does also have a huge slide bar. I just saw that. So this might actually... Um, converge back out again, just like it says in the description here. How it's going to converge to one central point and then break back out. Okay, so I, I I misspoke there. So it'll probably have a couple of these kind of branching up and downs where you basically are going to be weaving uh, more or less like a helix through this whole entire technology tree. So I'm very curious too to see how that's going to work out with your skills and how that might actually mitigate or or even restrict some of your play. Um, and this is also wishful thinking. I know that the, they would never do something like this in Total War Warhammer, but it'd be really cool if you decided to go either really heavy yin or really heavy yang, if it had an actual aesthetic change in your army or your character and stuff like that like like think of like nice little old republic or any of the old bioware games if you went really 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 evil your character started to look super evil so if you went super yin which is not necessarily evil right it's just like you're you're taking more of an aggressive route if they took more of an aggressive stance right they're they're um kind of like hunched over looking a little more eager for combat whatever it is something like that that kind of colored the actual playthrough and and, and style of your army but that's a little too little too wishful thinking i think but it'd just be nifty to see so that kind of covers all of our mechanics here in this blog post today if you have any questions or any comments please guys by all means let me know and leave some feedback let them know what you're feeling about these mechanics do you like them do you feel certain things are lacking certain things may be too complex because there's going to be a lot to manage per turn and they do say that that is kind of going to be the big thing here is managing each one of these but we will hopefully be getting more mechanics uh soon from creative assembly on maybe corn or um zinch right we know we haven't heard or seen anything from zinch um or even kislev i'd love to get a full-fledged article like this for kislev to really drill down into a lot of their mechanics to get an idea of how that campaign is going to play because right now cafe looks like it's going to be a really crazy fun campaign with a lot of complexities but as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.